Hi, everybody. Um, I am really excited about this panel. Our music and research panel is one of my favorites every year um, because it's just like a little taste of so many different things and so many interesting topics that people are doing real research on. Um, I think people sometimes think about when I say music and data, they forget that qualitative data is also data. Um, and so you're going to get some really great insights into a lot of qualitative research in addition to some quant research as well, including hearing back again from our sponsors at Chartmetric and also so our panel is going to be moderated um, by a, another sponsor um, from the MLC. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's bring Andrew up to the stage. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to Measure Music 2024. Hi, Christine. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring the rest of the, the team up as well. Go. And take it away, Andrew. Thank you. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, such a pleasure to be here with all of you. I just want to introduce our very esteemed group of panelists. We have Ruth Timmermans, independent researcher. We have Sarah Klobovis with Chartmetric. And we have Vishruti Bindal and Prathana Sen with uh, Nian Culture. Welcome. All right, so uh, I'm particularly excited about this. Uh, I'm very passionate about music in, music research in general um, and, and any kind of data-driven and qualitative insight, um, mostly because there are a, a lot of people with opinions, right? But music research helps us know what is and, and really looks under the hood to help us understand what's going on. Um, all of our panelists today have some really good insi insights and have done a lot of work that I hope everyone can really benefit from. Um, so we are going to start off with Ruth Timmermans, and she's going to take us away and talk about analyzing gatekeeper networks. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Measure of Music, for inviting me. Um, today, I will dive into the old boys network, um, which is still a hot topic in the music industry. And I'll share how I approach this topic from a digital humanities perspective. Um, apparently, I can click through my slides, but um, it doesn't seem to work. Um, Hey Ruth, um, do you want to send me send me the slides? Um, we'll get that taken care of. Okay, thank you. And we'll have um, Vishruti and Pratana uh, present next, and we'll just swap out. No big deal. Okay, thank you. No problem at all. Hold on one second. We'll switch you guys out. Hey everyone, we're so excited to be here and. Thank you, Christine, for making this opportunity possible. We're as excited to learn and, and present this panel as everyone else. And we're here today to talk about Bangalore Music City, which is a survey that Vishruti and my music consultancy called Neon Culture has conducted um, over the last six months or so. And I'm just quickly going to take everyone through uh, an introduction of Neon Culture. So we're a music business consultancy based out of Bangalore, and we use education to bridge the gaps between where people are missing information, especially in the non-film music industries in India. And we co-founded um, this in 2023, August last year. And Vishruti, who's my wonderful partner, we thought we'd introduce each other, has, Vishruti has eight years of experience across all sorts of roles in the music industry. She's been an engineer, an artist manager, music education specialist, also worked on curation, music supervision, among other things. And currently she holds a consulting position at Momentual by Sound Diplomacy as an education manager. And she's also an instructor at the Berklee College of Music for the Global Emerging Markets and the Music Cities module. And um, I am so proud to work with someone like this every day. I'm going to let Vishruti continue. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. And thank you so much for that introduction, P. Uh, I'm going to introduce my co-founder, Pratna Sen. 
who has 10 years of experience working in music industry across various roles like operations, community development, music curation, A&R, artist management, and emerging technology. Most notably, she was part of the early SOFA Sounds team and led the expansion, training, and development to scale their global presence in 400 cities globally. And uh, of course, she specializes in market research and has worked with numerous music and emerging startups in the music industry. So yeah, that's us at Neon Culture. Um, I'll also dive a little bit into our services and products at Neon. Uh, like Pratma said a little bit, we try and identify and bridge the knowledge gaps in the music industry hyper-locally. And we also work with independent artists and organizations as such. Uh, we work through three tiers of products and services. The first part is our consulting services. So we work with companies and organizations in music across research, a &R, curation, supervision, and business development for companies trying to set up in India. We also work with artists directly with consulting services, and we help with capacity building and education for their projects and knowledge gaps in music business to help them set up foundations. And we also work on products and IPs of our own. Most notably, we recently launched our first edition of the Deccan Alternative Music Conference. And of course, today is about the Bangalore Music City agenda that we have set up for 2026. Uh, so uh, getting into the survey, I actually set up this survey in 2021 as a part of my uh, Berkeley thesis. And the reason why I set out to do this was that I used to work at a music venue in Bangalore in 2019, which shut down because of bad policy making and lack of support from the local uh, music and other industry stakeholders. And it was a very personal motivation to start a survey like this because we needed hard research to come up with solutions for this gap in the Bangalore music scene. And when we started Neon, it was a natural progression for both of us to continue this research on because Pratna has a solid background in music research and we both have a great interest in this. So then we decided to bring it back in 2023 and we could continue working on this annually. So diving a little bit into what the demographics were like for our 2023 survey, which ran for six months, um, we categorized respondents into three uh, categories, artists, industry, and fans. Uh, we kind of look at the local music ecosystem in this triangular fashion with, where you know every side is equal and has an equal stake in the music ecosystem and how it works with each other. So I've just broken down a little bit of the age and the gender demographics in terms of responses as well. Um, we'll dive into the artist income a little bit. And this is where Vishruti and I start comparing some of the 2021 line of questioning and how we develop that further into the 2023 line of questioning and hopefully build on this from here on out. So take it away, Vishwiti. So yeah, so in the 2020-21 survey, essentially the idea was to also, because it was the pandemic period, it was to understand and potentially figure out a way to categorize artists into various categories based on their average monthly income. Uh, we set up set it up so that professional artists were artists who were making a significant amount of income through music directly, so about 50% or more. Semi-professional were anywhere between 50% to about 10%. And whoever was not making a significant amount of income, at least 20% from music were categorized as amateur artists. Uh, so mostly hobbyists or artists who are not really seeking active income opportunities in music and maybe have other things that they're more interested in as an income source. And that's kind of how we set that up. Uh, Pratna will take you through how we developed this further in 2023. Yeah, so in last year's survey, we actually wanted to find out what are the ranges when artists say that, you know, I do music either part time or full time or as an amateur or as a semi professional. And we do have a little bit of a breakdown in, you know, through the respondents uh, information that we got. So we'll be working on this uh, to kind of speak to artists specific to each group and develop policy for each of them going forward through Neon and the work we do. Um, a little bit more on the sources of income for artists. Vishwati, do you want to talk about 2021? Yeah, so in 2021, we saw that 
primarily artists were making their income through live which may sound surprising because it was during covid but it still was a very significant income because they were still doing things like private and corporate shows they were doing streaming events and things like that so all of that get was included in the live part which is about 90% uh, a lot of them were also teaching music a lot of artists in bangalore pivoted towards teaching during the pandemic because online classes became quite popular uh, a sync and royalties and publishing and that the domain of music industry is quite underdeveloped as you can see from the 2021 survey as well so it only accounted for 6% and we we don't really present a lot of that data for you here but we like i can tell you a little bit more in the sense that the sync industry is very underdeveloped so it was not that they weren't interested in making money from sync it was also lack of knowledge um, in that that we identified as a gap but yeah pratna 2023 not much has changed in 2023 as you can see live still remains the main source of income for artists in our home city bangalore um but we have seen a slight bit of increase in other income sources which we kind of clubbed everything apart from live and royalties in publishing and music um marketing and merch and partnerships into this category we're yet to dig deeper into what the other sources of income are but we are interested to see other avenues of income open up for artists because as the pandemic taught us um mm -hmm. live events can stop overnight so you know you can't be too dependent on one source of income yeah uh digging a little bit into this live uh music scene and what happened in 2019 that i was talking about in my introduction to this survey uh there were three primary issues that we identified through our research in 2021 uh there was a big closure of music venues in 2019 but it was building over two decades of back and forth between the venues and the resident welfare associations a uh, primary result primary reason why this happened was that venues were not categorized as separate entities from restaurants and bars and a lot of those regulations ended up applying to venues when it was it could have been avoided so there was a big one was governance issues we don't really have a music city office or an export office there's there's no formal support in terms of grants or financial support for music stakeholders in the city and there's very little access to public spaces uh second was obviously the live industry issues we have very small very few uh, small and mid sized venues for grassroots artists to be incubated so the kind of understanding is that you do a house concert or an informal gig and then you're suddenly expected to sell 500 plus venues which um kind of results in stunted growth for many artists in the city and then finally uh in terms of audience insights the really light engaging with this growing house concert scene which resulted as a lack of live music venue situation in bangalore uh, but at the same time a lot of audiences also believed that the music was dead because their favorite way which is going out to a venue and watching the gig was now not happening anymore because of um, venue shutting down and yeah everything was in the end a result of bad policy making so yeah that was something that was highlighted in the 2021 study So taking these this kind of background on live music in Bangalore we wanted to find out how much of you know a lack of this formal live industry or standards that are this scan or do or do or practice um actually exist in real life and that's what came out of our survey this year um there's still there's a huge range of how much artists charge for live performances and we're focusing on live so much because it's still the largest source of income for artists in our city um so artists can charge anything between 5000 rupees to 2 and a half lakh rupees which you know for those who don't know the conversion i believe it's 250000 if we were to use like the international um comma values but that's a huge range artists don't have any kind of standards on where do we start charging for live performances so it just seems really unfair that some artists are charging on the lower end of this and some artists are able to charge on the higher end of this and there's no open information or open knowledge um flowing between these two groups um we also found out that artists who perform live only 19% of them ask for performance contracts 
So a lot of this, the lack of contracts results in defaulted payments, delayed payments. Um, a lot of times artists don't get paid because there's nothing in writing that's kind of saying that you will get paid this much by this date. Um, that's a practice that we found out that we could you know, work towards changing through the survey. Um, we also found out that 51% of artists who, who responded to our survey and are doing live performances and it's the biggest source of income from them are asking for advance payments to secure their bookings, but there's still no formal industry as such which was highlighted in Vishwati study in 2021, and it still continues in 2023, a good two years after the pandemic, even after the demand for live performances has boomed. So these are all areas that um, we were able to observe, and we now have data to back it up. So it makes it all the more um, important and all the more useful to start working towards this at the policy level. Yeah. Another thing that we identified that we also have touched upon is this, the lack of awareness around other income resources apart from live and teaching and, you know, some of the other obvious ones, uh, which is this whole um, black hole of money sitting with performance rights organizations, because not a lot of artists from the city, even the country are signed to a PRO. In 2021, we saw IPRs had only 6,000 memberships and it has only reached about 8,500 in 2023-2024. Uh, although we do see a slight decrease in percentage of artists who are not signed up to a PRO. So that is a good sign that publishing is developing quite slowly but steadily in India. Uh, some things that we as Neon have managed to do to bridge some of these gaps are we run workshops called Catalyst Sessions once every month uh, where we also make uh, copyright and signing up to a PRO and administering copyright as a primary uh, thing that we educate on. We also highlighted this at our conference that we uh, organized recently where we had both PRS UK and IPRS India at the conference available to network, discuss and educate on the topic of copyright. Apart from that, we also run a partnership with PRS. We ran it at the conference and we continue to run it where we've managed to sign close to 40 authors and composers from the city of Bangalore to administer their rights with PRS UK and saved close to 4,000 pounds in sign up fees. So we're very proud of the work that we're able to do using this research and putting it into practice as well. Moving away from all of the artist data for a minute, we also surveyed people who identify as folks who work in the music industry and what they do in the music industry. Um, in the 2020-21 line of uh, questioning, we asked artists, who are the professionals on your team? Because ultimately every artist, once they reach a certain point of growth or once they start um, you know, releasing music regularly, it's important and very useful to have a team around you. And a lot of artists kind of broke it down for us. Most people had managers and booking agents. Uh, a decent chunk had publishers. But you know, once we got to like other roles, um, the proportion of the roles kept getting smaller and smaller. Some of them didn't even show up significantly on the data. So we took that and we actually built this new category for industry stakeholders in the 2023 survey. And we asked folks, what do you do in the music industry when you work behind the scenes? Majority of folks said they work multiple roles um, because our industry is not at the point yet where everyone can have a full-time stable income just working in a professional capacity in music. So a lot of people do multiple roles in any combination of all of the roles we identified in the previous survey. Um, a huge number of people do take on producer and audio engineering roles, as well as management and representation. But everything else sort of collapses into those roles as well. So we're still digging deeper to find out what are the kind of roles in the music industry that need to grow or that need to be um, you know, more incubated. We need to train more people to become uh, you know, lawyers or consultants with different artists and different campaigns. So this is an interesting statistic that came up through our music industry uh, part of the research. 
And then we also wanted to do a little bit more digging into the actual audience, because who are the people who are listening to this music, discovering artists, going out to shows? And what we found was interesting because most of the people who recorded that, yes, I do attend gigs as an audience member, has to have a minimum income of 40,000 rupees per month, which is an exclusionary practice because not everyone makes that kind of money. Um, we want to cross collate that as a next step with, you know, um, income patterns in the state or in the city and see where, uh, how we can bring in people with even lower income thresholds, because we're potentially not opening up the possibility of um, experiencing live music to a lot of people with this practice, which is in our, you know, in our analysis, quite exclusionary. We also found out where else audience are spending their money. So most people are spending their money on restaurants and food or travel and vacations or other cultural experiences like museums, theaters, um, dance, uh, painting, other, other kinds of artistic experiences. So these could also be positioned as either competing leisure activities, of course, that, you know, music kind of shows up, live music shows up as another category there, or it could be a brand partnership opportunity for people who are looking to work in music as an entrepreneur, as a creative um, strategic person. So this is, again, very useful data that we were able to collect, and we'll now be able to build upon this when we go forward, talking to other brands and talking to in investors in music, looking at where do where do I put my money in the city of Bangalore? Looking at the genre distribution from both the surveys, this is our 2023 survey data, and we see how uh, the supply and demand kind of meet each other. So whatever music in terms of the genres and the and the ensembles that artists are making in the city is very it mirrors what the audience is also interested in in the city so there's definitely a very solid fan base for homegrown artists in the city and we see this time and again with a lot of artists in the city building a cult following in bangalore and then doing greater things outside of bangalore so uh, i think it's a trend it's something that uh, artists should look out for and actively seek uh, doing music in the genre that they are interested in because there is an audience for almost everything in Bangalore, as you can tell. And it also stays consistent from the 2021 research that I did, where it was pretty much the same genre distribution on both sides of artists and fans. Uh, next slide. Uh, so looking at the gaps in, in, in investment opportunities, comparing both surveys, uh, the you can kind of see that in the 2021 survey, there was a lot of um, obviously echoes of public advocacy, funding opportunities, music venues as some of the bigger things that people were looking into especially since venues had just shut down. Uh, in 2023, lack of venues remains consistent uh, and funding opportunities also remain consistent. Apart from that, you can also see things like decent pay, uh, crossing out of pub gigs, so playing cover shows and crossing, crossing over into playing original music, playing in more venue settings than in pub settings, things like that also keep cropping up. So we can kind of see that the gaps have actually kind of increased but also almost uh, shown themselves a lot more in the 2023 survey and i think this also gives us room to build more entrepreneurship opportunities in the city uh, looking at these gaps as as opportunities essentially so i think that's what we would encourage local stakeholders to focus on with this finding uh, Finally, just talking about why our research matters and why NEON does this research. Uh, firstly, we really want to hear from the right stakeholders. I think from my experience of doing the survey and working in the music industry, uh, this what I felt strongly and has reflected in both these surveys is the music policy in Bangalore gets dictated by everyone but the music stakeholders. It gets dictated by the res resident welfare associations. It gets it's dictated by the restaurant and bar associations. It gets dictated by housing and with uh, occupation licenses and certificates and all other things except for the music stakeholders who don't really get surveyed or asked about their needs and wants and opinions. Uh, and that's something that we really want to change by building consistent data over a number of years and, and doing something with it, taking it to policymakers, 
to other stakeholders and building more conversations and bridging those gaps in conversations between stakeholders in the city. And that's one of the primary reasons why we run this research. And second, we have a very strong music city agenda. We really believe that Bangalore could shine as a music city. It has a great scene. It may not have uh, a mature industry, but we are slowly getting there. And being able to document trends and preferences and the needs of our stakeholders in the city will enable us to lobby and engage with people who are decision makers much better. So we hope to be able to build more data by 2026 to be able to do that. So please wish us luck. And uh, yeah, Pratna will take us take you through other reasons why we do this. Um, yeah, there's also a serious lack of support in the music industry. And because these surveys were done when the pandemic was affecting the music industry at its most, and a little bit after when the demand for live events has really had a massive boom in the music industry, we still see a similar lack of support, a similar lack of knowledge and information flowing between artists, stakeholders, industries, uh, industry folks and fans and other music stakeholders. And we really want to change this lack of support. So data helps us back up a lot of the reasons um, we are doing our workshops and our offerings and services. And finally, a neon research informs our work. Um, there's a serious lack of primary data in this industry and at a hyper-local level specifically. And how are we going to find out the inner workings of the industry if we don't hear from the people who are in it? So we are excited to do such research because Music from India is also showing up globally more and more and we want to build on what the people actually want so that's kind of the goal with our research we hope to do it every year we hope to have more respondents more diverse uh, respondents and be able to really advocate for this at a policy level so we can work towards our music city agenda and that is us yeah please feel free to get in touch those are our email addresses Thank you so much, Pratana and, and Vishruti. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, love the graphs, and I definitely learned a lot. I, I hope a lot of y'all did as well. Um, I think we'll try to go back to Ruth if she's ready. Um, yes, I don't see my slides at the moment, but um, OK, here they are, finally. Um, so yes. Um, Shall I start? Yeah. So as I was saying, I will share how I approach this topic from a digital humanities perspective. So my research partly responds, um, and here we go again. Uh, OK. Um, partly responds to calls, recent calls to apply a digital humanities approach to um, complex issues, such as this still um, intangible old boys network, which is widely seen as one as a very significant barrier to um, diversity, equity and inclusion in the music industry. However, um, and then next slide, please. Um, next slide. It also um, stems from my own background. Um, initially, I pursued a MA in socioeconomic history. And I worked for a while as an academic researcher, mainly on gender. And then for almost two decades, I was the director of Gonzo Circus, which is a prominent music and arts magazine in the Low Countries. Um, and during the pandemic, as so many other people, I returned to university um, and studied digital humanities. And the research I present today was also the subject of my thesis. Currently, I work as an independent researcher and writer based in Amsterdam, and I am um, also work with Lima, which is the Dutch knowledge platform for preservation and uh, presentation of digital art. Um, next slide. So, yes, please. Um, so having spent two decades in the music industry from um, uh, media perspective. My aim was to shed light on this old boys network and therefore I set out to construct, visualize and analyze a network of artistic directors and curators in particular in electronic music and uh, the adjacent digital art field 
both in the Netherlands and the Flemish part of Belgium. Uh, together, they're called the Low Countries between 2016 and 2022. To achieve this, I used social network data and digital tools um, rather than existing methods like interviews, surveys, or manual accounting, which is often used in uh, humanities and community research. For the theoretical framework, I borrowed some social network concepts, uh, and in particular, the assortativity mixing, which is the tendency of individuals to uh, connect with others with whom they share similar interests or um, attributes. And I also looked into gatekeeping theory, um, which has been fairly well researched for the creative industries, especially in relation to the lack of, to the lack of diversity. Um, next slide, please. Um, so then my research questions, uh, which are on the next slide. Um, so does this specific constructed network, because we're talking about a constructed network, not, not a reconstruction, um, show evidence of a gendered network structure? And the second question was, does the degree of gender-based assortative mixing in this network matches outcomes of previous research? And lastly, to what extent is gender-based assortative mixing influenced by professional field? And um, I looked at music and at art and their location, um, so Flanders, Flemish part of Belgium, including Brussels or the Netherlands. Um, next slide. So I had some additional research questions um, also about ethical issues, but I will not go into detail about them here. So um, let's move on then to the methodology I used, um, uh, which is, a, yeah, so, to start, I needed to develop a model that links gatekeeping practices in the music industry to Twitter behavior uh, of my selected gatekeepers. Uh, initially, I wanted to use data from LinkedIn, but uh, that's very challenging. So I uh, chose uh, Twitter. And at the time when I was doing my research, which was um, in spring of 2023, uh, the Twitter API still granted access to researchers. So uh, tracking how gatekeepers maintain and ga or gain and maintain their influence and also their level of embeddedness and connectivity, which are crucial elements um, for successful gatekeeping. I use two types of um, Twitter interaction, uh, namely mentions and replies, which you can see on the diagrams uh, on this slide. Um, and additionally, I also included um, um, others, um, gatekeepers that were not um, mentioned with an ad symbol, but were implicitly mentioned. And I will explain later how I did that, but I was inspired by Amalia Foca's uh, research on uh, an art world influencer network. So then um, the next slide will show the next steps. Um, I needed to um, compile a relevant data set. And I started with a list of gatekeepers who had a Twitter account, which was obviously very uh, important. And um, their, um, the selection crit criteria uh, for these gatekeepers, um, I would derive them from uh, existing research in um, humanities. And although I was very reluctant, I also included um, my own knowledge of the sector. And uh, my supervisor encouraged me to do so uh, because um, it would enrich my research and it would also align with uh, digital humanities principles. Then from the 152 selected gatekeepers, um, of which 109 were male, 43 female, and Unfortunately, non-gender expensive. I scraped uh, two, yeah, approximately two hundred thousand tweets. And obviously, as the cleaning and processing of this data, um, it required much more steps than I ex um, expected. And um, I will only discuss the most important ones here. So. Using supervised machine learning, I um, identified uh, sixty. 5,000 relevant tweets, 
And from these tweets uh, using um, NLP and uh, Spacey package in Python, both Dutch and English, because half of the tweets were in English, I extracted those people who were implicitly mentioned. Um, finally, I uh, so that left me with about 500 um, extracted additional gatekeepers and I added attributes like gender, location, and their field of interest uh, to those uh, gatekeepers. Then the next step was, which is on the next slide, um, was to visualize and analyze uh, the network. So I first imported the list of gatekeepers and their relations in Gephi, which is a um, uh, leading open source package for social network research or analysis. Um, so um, gatekeepers are called nodes and their relationships are called edges. Then I applied um, uh, several algorithms such as Force Atlas 2 and Louvain clustering algorithm to shape the network based on the relations and also to um, visualize the communities and, as we will see later, also the attributes. Um, <clears throat> I then uh, analyzed the structure of the network and some uh, specific measures to better understand the general characteristics of the network and also the behavior of the gatekeepers. Um, with Gephi, I was able to um, compute the degrees of influence, embeddedness, and connectivity for each node or gatekeeper. And I used uh, Python to um, compute the assortative mixing coefficients. So and um, at the bottom of this um, uh, slide, you can see the first um, visualization. And it doesn't make sense yet, but we will see more um, um, on the next slides. So um, the question then is, is this network structure gendered? And uh, this um, slide, the, the resulting graph already makes more sense. On this slide, we see uh, all uh, the network of gatekeepers where the size of each node corresponds with the degree of influence. The bigger the node, the more influential and powerful position this gatekeeper has. We can also see that this uh, network, um, not only on this image, but also on the data that are behind it, there are uh, approximately five communities or there are, uh, which I have identified based on my knowledge of the sector. And the blue and green communities uh, roughly correspond with uh, music, while the hot pink, um, well, it doesn't look really hot pink here, um, <laughs> on the top re represents digital art field. And um, at the bottom, you can see two closely related communities, um, the teal one and the um, more olive green. And these are related to electronic music that you can hear at influential festivals such as Rewire or Unsound or CTM in Berlin. And they form the core and the most influential nodes or um, gatekeepers can be found in this core and mostly in the teal one, which I have sort of called the established electronic music. Think of Afix Twin, for example. But on the next slide, um, the size of the nodes represents the ability of the gatekeeper to connect communities and to maintain network cohesion. And then we can see we find them everywhere <laughs> except in the core um, communities with the most influential nodes. And what this means, I will um, tell later. But first, let's look at the next slide. So here, um, keeping the two previous slide graphs in mind, uh, and this graph, um, the color of the nodes is uh, related to the gender. So dark yellow is male, um, blue is female, and um, pink is gender expensive. Um, and we see also that the size of the node uh, represents influence. Um, we can see that the influential nodes we find at the core community are mostly uh, male and that the bridging nodes that maintain um, 
um, network cohesion are predominantly women and gender expensive gatekeepers. They are there. It's not very clear from this visual, but it is there. And they work mostly in digital art or hybrid practice, like both in music and in um, art. So, um, so furthermore, on the next slide, um, uh, I investigated whether these gatekeepers in this network primarily connect to gatekeepers of the same gender. And overall, there is a low, low statistical tendency, even when I focused only on gatekeepers in music. And this appears to contradict prior academic research, um, assuming that male gatekeepers connect primarily with peers with the same gender. However, um, when we take into account also the field of interest and the location, this trend becomes moderate to strong, which aligns more with the expectations. And it's also consistent with findings in network theory that in professional settings, other attributes such as shared fields of interest and geographic proximity might also be very important and might reinforce um, each other. So um, in summary, which I, um, it's on the next slide. Um, my network analysis points out that the enduring lack of diversity in networks of artistic gatekeepers in the music industry uh, likely stems from a complex interplay of entrenched gendered network structures and also gendered gatekeeper behavior. And while my research mostly confirms earlier research on uh, male dominated uh, networks of artistic gatekeepers, albeit now from a more nuanced perspective, my research had also some surprising findings. Um, first of all, the constructed network and its communities closely mirror the real world network that I encountered in my professional career. And this similarity is very eerie when you know that the algorithms do not consider name or um, attributes such as, such as gender or where people work or where they live. So the, the algorithms don't know about this. Furthermore, um, it's a scale-free network. Um, and this means that influential um, nodes maintain their influence over time. And so for newcomers, it's really difficult to attain the um, the same level of um, influence. Um, so um, this also has implications for policy, obviously. Um, in addition, the influential gatekeepers display high levels of embeddedness. And we know from social network theory that this can lead to feedback loops in discourse and attitudes. So for example, um, gender specific notions of um, uh, about music or art will then be shared over and over again. And lastly, the network reflects actually the widely studied patterns of occupational gender uh, segregation in the music industry, where male gatekeepers continue to have influential artistic positions while female gatekeepers put in emotional labor to support the entire ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, and then um, in preparation of this panel, we were also asked to reflect on the value of independent data driven and in this case, digital humanities research for the music industry. Next slide, please. Um, so from my experience, such a digital humanities perspective can guide collaborative research efforts by communities, academics, the industry, and independent researchers, especially when it's about very challenging issues, uh, where more perspectives, and in particular, the perspective of those affected are needed. For example, grassroots communities such as Female Pressure have put a lot of unpaid labor into tracking gender representation on stage. And being able to access data sets in collaboration with companies such as, such as Chartmetric, as well as access to digital humanities methods and tools provided by academics and um, researchers could ease their workload and also entail uh, more in-depth and broad and uh, possibly intersectional research, which I was not able to do for this uh, research. 
And this in turn could then lead to more effective policies that truly foster uh, diversity, equity and uh, inclusivity in the music industry. And if you want to know more about my research, um, do send me a line and uh, thank you all for your attention. All right, thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, this is definitely a very meaningful and important topic uh, that definitely deserves more attention um, and imp improvement in particular. Uh, so thank you so much for that, very interesting. And I've just been keeping an eye on the comments in, in the meantime, and, and so far there's just a lot of really positive um, and very interested uh, participants in, in both the topics so far. Um, moving on to our last topic, and then um, we're going to have some questions at the end. So if anyone has any, please feel free to drop them in the comments. Um, we would like to welcome Sarah Klobovis. She's going to run us through Chart Metrics Year in Music 2023. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me present. All righty. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, I will be sharing about Chartmetrics uh, year report um, that aims to kind of give an overview of the social and streaming ecosystem from 2023. And it's all backed um, by Chartmetric data from the platform. So uh, diving right in. Um, if you're not familiar with Chartmetric, uh, it's an all-in-one platform for artists and industry professionals uh, to provide data for you to make um, data driven decisions about your career. Um, and I'll just be scrolling through this. Uh, so we have some fun animations um, here. This is just the um, breakdown here, but the first part is gonna focus on um, artists on chart metric. So we're currently tracking over 9.7 million artists growing from 8.4 million at the end of 2022. And here's a bit of that breakdown. Um, in 2023, we tracked 1.33 million artists. And here is um, the breakdown from the years prior as well. Um, on average, we ingest about around 3,000 new artists a day. Um, and that means that every day, Chartmetric adds around the same number of artists to the platform as there are players in the NBA, NHL, MLB, and NFL combined. So in terms of uh, volume of ingestion, uh, we have our top six countries here in terms of new profiles added, uh, with the United States at number one, Brazil at number two, then we see India, Germany, Mexico, and the UK. Um, kind of diving into some of the demographics of all of the artists across Chartmetric, um, we have their distribution between group and solo artists. So we see 34% are uh, groups, so bands or duos, um, and then 66% are solo artists. Um, looking at pronouns, a uh, quick disclaimer for this, this is based on self-reported data or public sur uh, sources. So, you know, Spotify bios and whatnot, that's how we kind of get our pronoun information. Um, but we found that the overwhelming majority are male. Um, over four times as many artists use he, him pronouns than she, her pronouns. And um, more information of this can be found at our uh, Make Music Data Set initiative. Um, next, I'll talk a little about our career stages. Um, so Chartmetric assigns every artist on the platform a career stage, and these are ranked by their Chartmetric Artist Score, which is an aggregate of various success over um, uh, various platforms. Um, so we have here Legendary are artists that are over 30 years old, so um, kind of your more catalog artists from um, a few years, 30 years ago. Um, and then we have superstar artists, which are ranked within the top 1.5 thousand artists. Um, and then the following stages kind of just go down uh, following that. 
Um, and so we wanted to kind of do a distribution of the artists um, that we adjusted in 2023. And um, we found that 99.9% .9 of them ended the year in undiscovered and developing categories, while the remaining 1% um, 0.1% were labeled as mid-level mainstream or superstar. Um, and uh, just quick wanted to mention that more info about this can be found in our methodology section at the end. Um, so a big question that we wanted to answer with this report is, um, can artists truly go from undiscovered to superstar? Um, and, and we found that most of the movement uh, occurs between the undiscovered and developing categories, but you're not necessarily necessarily seeing artists breaking immediately overnight, you know, to the undiscovered and superstar, or I'm sorry, just the superstar categories. Um, we did find a lot of movement um, in from mid-level artists moving up to the mainstream. Um, so rather than, you know, the overnight success, we see that artists that slowly like uh, established dedicated fan bases are able to you know build that um, build up their career just keep scrolling here here we look at some of the top artists of the year and so this is by their peak monthly chart metric score in 2023 um, and you can see here um, all of the different artists and click on them. Um, by the way, if anyone wants to follow along with me, this report is available at reports.chartmetric.com. Um, sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier. But what we really noticed here um, with this graph is just that there's not much movement in terms of who's at the top. It's kind of the same 15 artists throughout the year. Um, as you can see, Taylor Swift just absolutely killed it the last, the latter half of the year. Um, and we saw that seven artists made the top 10 every month. Bad Bunny, Drake, Ed Sheeran, Justin Bieber, Rihanna, Taylor Swift, and The Weeknd. Here is another breakdown of top artists by the peak chart metric score for the year. Um, so this is also, uh, tall, you can toggle by country. Um, so you definitely notice um, that the top artists definitely depends out at what countries you're looking at. Um, so here is a breakdown of the uh, top 100 artists, again, uh, by P chart metric score in terms of home country. Um, and you see that we have a large presence of the US and UK. Um, but we also see um, some awesome representation from South Korea, Puerto Rico, Colombia, and you know, despite their small size, South Korea and Puerto Rico took um, those spots, and they, um, when they only account for less than 0.7 percent of the global population. And also, here's a breakdown of uh, those gender demographics for those top 100 artists. Um, I think it's really awesome that, you know, while we see from the, uh, the breakdown earlier of 77% of the artists on our platform uh, using he, him pronouns, we do see the, the top artists here, we have some good representation of, you know, female artists and um, non-binary and gender fluid. Um, here's some artist highlights. I, I would encourage anyone following along to go in and check out these profiles. These are just artists that we felt um, on the chart metric team had incredible year in 2023. Um, and it's just a bit about their year and uh, you know um, their, their career stage and their pot, um, Spotify monthly listeners. Um, and you can take through uh, a look through this. Um, so now we're moving on to tracks. Um, Chartmetric has data on uh, over 103 million tracks from over 31 million albums. Here's a quick sankey on our, um, our track growth. 
2023, a total of um, over 17 million tracks were ingested in the chart metric system, uh, over 7 million which were released this year. It would take you 117 years to listen to all this music. 42 of those years would be spent on music released in 2023 alone. And in that time, you could go to Mars and back 36 times. Um, here's a little breakdown on our track releases um, on, in terms of uh, time of release. Uh, here we definitely see Friday being uh, the most popular day, no surprise there. But um, we also saw some interesting spikes around the holidays, like Valentine's Day and Halloween. Um, and then in, on a monthly basis, uh, we saw that March, May and June were the most popular months in terms of uh, track releases. Um, and here is the top tracks and you can toggle this by platform. So we have radio, Shazam, Spotify, TikTok, and YouTube. Um, and there's definitely some, a lot of similarities uh, between these. You see Flowers by Miley Cyrus just absolutely dominated this year. Um, but there is some variance as well especially when we look at YouTube, uh, we start to see more of a variation and um, more a prevalence of Latin music and um, K-pop, just showing how global of a platform YouTube really is. All right, so next uh, is our part two, which is uh, genres, platforms, and trends. Uh, so with 7,505 different genres in our system, um, this, uh, these genres, I'm um, sorry, um, that's nearly as many genres as there are episode, um, episodes of the Wheel of Fortune. So we put a little graphic of Vanna White there. <laughs> so in terms of uh, the volume of for tracks and the genres associated with those tracks and artists, um, we analyzed the genres with them for all time and um, songs and artists added in 2023. Um, so for 2023, we saw that hip hop and rap were the genres associated with most artist profiles, followed by pop and electronic, and a similar trend follows suit for track genres. So then uh, next, we wanted to look at the Spotify's top 100. We did a bit of a genre breakdown for those four tracks and artists. Um, so interestingly, um, while you see that pop, 39% um, of um, artists are categorized as pop artists, um, only 24% of the top tracks were pop. And then you also start to see more of a, a distribution um, with Latin music, is absolutely dominating this year, alongside um, some awesome uh, K-pop and um, so rather than just looking at um, the volume of uh, of artists or tracks, we wanted to see what genres were actually trending. Um, so we looked at emerging artists, and um, the methodology for this section is a is a bit complex, so I'm not gonna dive crazy into it, um, but we looked specifically at emerging artists, and you can look at our methodology section to see kind of how we categorize artists as emerging. Um, but we noticed that most emerging artists were releasing tracks it, that were Latin, Indian, K-pop, and African. While the remaining uh, genres, definitely there's a, a huge volume of those tracks still being released, um, but we noticed the emerging artists were really focusing um, on those uh, genres at the top. Uh, so next I'll uh, dive into our streaming and radio section, which kind of aims to analyze the, the ecosystem on Spotify, YouTube, and the radio. Uh, so here, um, so of the 9 million, over 9 million artists that we track on Spotify, um, these artists had a combined total of 65.8 billion monthly listeners and 21.6 billion followers. Um, so you'll notice those numbers are very high, um, and that's because the listeners and followers are not unique. So um, if a fan or an, uh, a user 
follows 10 artists, that user is counted 10 times. Um, and more information can be found in the methodology section there. Um, but we wanted to also um, take a look at Spotify monthly listeners across all of the artists. And we found that 81% of artists have less than 1,000 monthly listeners. In terms of upload, um, artists on Spotify have uploaded a combined 871.78 years of music to the platform, which is nearly twice the amount of time there was between Le the Leonardo da Vinci painting of the Mona Lisa during the Italian Renaissance and Beyonce releasing her 2022 album, Renaissance. Uh, so here we just provide some of the uh, top playlists on Spotify. And you can uh, toggle this off by editor editorial and non-editorial and all time in 2023. Um, and on average, songs added to playlists this year lasted 44.13 days before being taken off. And that's just about how long it takes to climb to Mount Everest from the base camp to the peak. Now looking at radio, um, we a chart metric tracks over 3,000 radio stations across um, over 1,000 cities and 91 countries. And we saw that uh, there was a total of 754 million track spins, um, which makes up for 1,716 years of airplay. And that's more years than there are musical instruments. So top genres um, on the radio, we saw that pop accounted for the majority. No surprise there, really, but. <laughs> um, yeah, and then we have our top artists here by Radio Spins as well. And you can also, we also have top tracks by radio. Uh, so you can go in and hover over a country and see uh, what dominated that year, or last year, sorry. Lastly, we have YouTube. Um, across all 9.7 artists on Chartmetric, we saw 11.6 trillion new views. Uh, and 26 billion new subscribers. Again, these uh, numbers are non-unique. And again, we have our, uh, from the YouTube, the YouTube's global weekly charts, uh, these are the top songs that spent the most time um, on the top charts. And again, we see a lot of Latin and, and K-pop here, uh, just showing how global the platform YouTube really is. And here's that breakdown by country and genre for the uh, top songs on the chart as well. And I think it's really cool here that we see um, India having such a prevalence as well alongside, again, we have like Puerto Rico and uh, South Korea. And here's those genres as well, which we see pop falling kind of low um, compared to these the other graphs that we looked at for the other platforms. And now quickly, um, I'm just going to brush over our social media section, which we analyzed uh, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. So we tracked um, total artist followers across these platforms, um, and we saw the greatest uh, new followers are were coming from TikTok, which had a 24.5% growth rate. And here you're able to toggle off and see who the top artists by platform were in terms of new followers gained. And, and there's, there are some interesting findings here, like Jason Derulo, you see having a huge um, success on YouTube. Um, again, Carol G and Shakira, BTS, more, um, more global genres on YouTube. And here's uh, some quick audience demographics. Uh, TikTok, we found, had the youngest user base with over 71% of followers being under the age of 24. As well as more male users um, using YouTube. And here uh, we did audience location. Um, so where users, users for these platforms, uh, what countries kind of were they from? And we saw the US being at the top for all three. And then we also saw a lot of prevalence from Brazil and Mexico. And lastly, uh, just going to brush over some of our TikTok trends. These are some more uh, deep dives. Uh, there's some fun insights on all of these uh, trends. But we found that there are three main um, kind of things we noticed this year. 
Um, one we call throw it, throw it back to the throwbacks. Um, it's no surprise that TikTok can revitalize old music, but um, we, these were three songs that we really noticed this year. Uh, Barbie Girl, thanks to the, the amazing Barbie movie that came out. Um, Linger by the Cranberries and Make Your Own Kind of Music. Um, the second major trend that we saw were uh, niche genres, um, that niche genres can really thrive on TikTok. Um, and these can, deeper dives into all of these can be found um, at our blog, How Music Charts, um, where we do insights on trends and um, industry uh, things. <laughs> um, but one the, the we saw Q Core Rap was one genre, Eurodance, and Sad Girl Indie, which is personally my favorite. <laughs> um, and the last one was Dancing the Night Away. Um, dance trends are always have always been a part of uh, pop culture and they're still just thriving on TikTok. And we saw that with uh, Pine Grove's Need To, Water by Tyla, and Rush by Troye Sivan. And again, you can go in and read more um, about all of these. Um, and that's that's a wrap for uh, Chart Matrix 2023 Year in Music Report. Um, thank you so much. And um, if you want to find out more, um, you can feel free to email me at sarah at chartmetric.com. And um, yeah, here's some more information also about uh, other uh, chart metric. Here's our, our um, how music charts and uh, one sheet. Um, so yeah. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, some really great graphs in here. And, um, you know, the numbers just keep getting more and more mind blowing. Uh, I can remember five years ago or three years ago, you know, what some of these numbers are. And, you know, 871 years worth of music uploaded to Spotify. So, uh, certainly, certainly hard to even get your head around. Um, but that was wonderful. Uh, so, we're going to bring back the group. Um, First, I just wanted to compliment you all on fantastic presentations. Um, uh, very interesting. And um, if for anyone, we had a few comments um, asking to either keep in touch or to actually get their hands on some of the research. Um, so I would just encourage everyone to look through the comments. There, there are a couple links in there that you might be able to follow uh, as well as email addresses. Um, we're gonna go to some questions now. And um, again, if anyone has any, put them in the chat. But I want to start off with a, a few um, before we do that. And the first one is just um, clearly the work that you have done um, is very impactful and, and has the ability to, to shape the music industry. Um, what do you hope that people out there use this information for? I think there's a lot of challenges um, embedded in here, which also means there's opportunities. So I want to just go around the horn real quick and and just see what what do you hope gets accomplished from the work that you've done. Let's start with uh, uh, maybe Vishruti. You want to answer for Neon Culture? Yeah, sure. I think with our work, like we also said in our presentation, we really hope that people can take some of these gaps, knowledge gaps, and make them into opportunities for the music industry locally. Uh, we really see people setting up a lot more businesses, even setting up this research in other cities. We really want to actively want music stakeholders to engage more and, and do more because uh, we, we see that music stakeholders can really change this industry and make it into an industry from a scene if they'd like. So I think our research really wants to drive that change hyper-locally, so to speak. Great. Prathana, yeah. Prathana, anything to add to that? Yeah, nothing to add to the hyper-local bit, uh, but I think on a global platform like this, um, it's very useful to have more information about the Indian music industry. And because India is such a huge country, um, you can't ever represent it nationally accurately. So that's why we, we're so focused on bringing hyper-local information to more global stages. Great. How about you, Ruth? Um, yeah, great question. Um, first of all, um, I think um, I would like to see that there is awareness about this topic. Um, People talk about it, it's in news reports, it's in academic research, but it was always, as someone also said in the comments anecdotally, um, or from qualitative research, and now you can actually see it. 
Uh, obviously, it's a small niche, but I think um, if you expand this research to a larger um, group uh, or other genres, you might see the same or you might see something different. And I think also what I would like is to see more digital humanities research combining this big data or with uh, humanities insights. And um, yeah, that's what I hope. And, and I hope also that if like, for example, governments order research, they also think in this direction um, to make policy. Definitely, definitely. All right, what do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I think for, for our report, we just really wanted to um, kind of shed the light on just the e ecosystem as a whole. And our, our hope is, you know, to kind of um, bring bring attention to the, the lack of diversity in some areas, but also kind of show the hope that they are there is growing diversity and um, we're seeing those artists at the top and also um you know a hope is also that people will see that um it, it is increasingly difficult to to break through the noise these days um and that we can continue to find ways that you know artists who aren't you know in the top 20 percent um are are able to make a sustainable living um, off of their music Great, great. All right, next question. Um, so before you go into doing any sort of research, you know, oftentimes you have a, a hypothesis or maybe some assumptions of what you think you might find um, to be proven or disproven through the work that you do. Um, what surprised you the most? And, and if there's anything that maybe didn't surprise you and, and just confirmed what you thought you would find, I'd be interested to know that as well. And we'll just, we'll just go in the same order. Um, I can take this on behalf of Neon. So sure. I think for our 2023 research, we didn't really go in with the hypothesis. The goal was to get baseline information. And now we build hypotheses from this for the next couple of years. And we add questions on it. Um, yeah, honestly, we were just surprised so many people took it. That was the surprise. <laughs> <laughs> we hope to get more people to take the survey in the future. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think I already mentioned some of the things. Um, so um, the network actually, um, or the, the fact that it was male dominated didn't surprise me. It was just a confirmation. Um, but yeah, what did surprise me was that using algorithms that it looked so similar to uh, how the, I know that these people, I know their names, of course, it's aggregated and um, the data, the names will remain anonymous, but I know these people mostly, and I know uh, who are close to each other, also from their social media, hanging out together. So it was so, so uh, the network was, the, the algorithm was working and I could see them connect. And it was so like, oh, wow, this is really like real life. And that was, it was actually also scary. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Um, yeah, for us, I mean, like you said, some of those numbers are just kind of insane. Um, but um, also, in terms of our hypotheses, I think we kind of we kind of knew a lot of the trends were going on, but the, it was just the data that really validated it. Like, um, you know, like most artists not breaking out of the und undiscovered category um, or um, yeah, just like the numbers of like the platforms and whatnot. We kind of we kind of knew where the trends were happening, but the 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 data just validated our hypothesis. Uh, for those out here watching, what is the best way that um, people can help either support your companies or the missions that you're driving um, and just music research in general? Um, I guess from, from Neon's perspective, like Vishwati said, we want to bring the survey to more cities. So we are actively looking for um, people like us in other cities in India who want to work with us and build on the survey and kind of 
build this mega repository of data from every single music industry within this huge country. Um, yeah, and in terms of supporting our business, just check me on out. Um, I think Vishwati dropped our sub stack somewhere in the comments. Um, and that's where we do a lot of our writing. We'll publish the report for this data. We'll publish, publish the report from our conference as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess stay in touch. Yeah, the same goes for me. And as I mentioned, I think we need to move to a collaborative approach um, with all um, everyone involved here and everyone who wants to foster diversity and inclusion in the music industry. And I have many ideas for future research, and I hope I can uh, collaborate with people to, um, to research this, these topics. Yeah, um, in terms of support for us, um, we, we love feedback. Um, we would appreciate any feedback that you have on the report, um, what, what you want to hear more of, um, what questions you're asking. And um, we, like I've, I've mentioned our blog, How Music Charts, we kind of aim to continue research throughout you know, the entirety of the year. And, and we dive into really uh, specific uh, questions there and trends. Um, and I think just reaching out and if you have a, a question that maybe would be worth us, you know, diving into, we would really love to hear it. Great. Love these answers. All right. So this will be the final question. Um, what does your research indicate about the future of the music industry? Could you please repeat that one, Andrew? Sure. So based on your research and the things that you've learned um, through your through your work, what do you think this says about the future of where the music industry is going and how it's evolving? Yeah, I think for us at Neon, <clears throat> we see that people really care in the music industry in Bangalore just by the essence of how many people actually took our survey seriously and responded to it. Uh, and the fact that they are following up on the results and we already, because we did premiere some of this data at our conference and we saw a lot of positive feedback and a lot of interest and curiosity to do something with this data. So I think for us, it's been very positive. Um, Ratna, what do you think you want to add to that? Yeah, um, the future of the music industry is heading towards more collaboration i think that's that's what we're seeing with all of our work um from my research i think it's it's really hard to say something about the future of the music industry in general but i think the after the pandemic um there was there is a less interest in uh, diversity and inclusion at least here uh, in the Netherlands where I live and in Belgium it's a bit like oh we've discussed this topic so many times but I think actually there is still so much to research and so much to improve um, so I think we need to yeah be aware of it and uh, keep being aware about it to have yeah to improve the music industry yeah i think our report kind of pointed towards the fact that it's just getting harder and harder for artists to really break through the noise with the you know just the amount of music that's out there and you know with ai and everything it's just becoming increasingly increasingly busy um but in a more positive note i think that there's a lot of really awesome trends going on under the scene that artists can tap into like these micro genres and you know and uh, collaborations with you know breaking outside of your your um, genre that you're usually releasing from like um, I think that's I think that's kind of where the, our report suggested that it's heading great great well I'd like to just take the opportunity to thank you all for for bringing all the work and effort that went into this and, and sharing it with everyone. Um, I personally enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I think the comments also confirm that, that everyone got a lot out of this. So thank you all for everything and hope you have a great day. 
Thank you all so much, Andrew. Thank you for being our moderator today. Thank you to our wonderful presentations, um, presenters. Um, obviously, everyone really, really loved the research. Um, if you guys can send me your uh, decks or whatever, whatever you want to share with everyone, I know everyone's very eager to see it. So I'll make sure it gets added to the conference platform so everyone can go back and review uh, later on um, because I know everyone has a lot more questions about everything you're working on as well. Um, so with that, I would say thank you so much um, to everybody. A special thank you to Sarah being part of Chartmetric for being our sponsor for the fourth year in a row. Um, and a big thank you to Andrea at the MLC for also being a sponsor this year. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to everyone that's all the great questions, all the engagement. Um, we have one last panel um, before the presentations. So um, we're looking forward to that. And thank you, my uh, speakers. Have a great day, guys. Um, and see you guys all in the next session. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much.